Okay, cool. So we're getting a few people joining, which is great. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, hopefully that's because our supposition is right that this is a resonant topic that, uh, well, to my knowledge, hasn't really ever been talked about at Kantar in an IND context um, at all, I don't think. Um, and um, we're going to explore what class citizen means, um, how it might uh, come to life, how uh, it may have the lived experiences of those uh, across the class spectrum, how it may have played out in their careers and otherwise. And of course, importantly, we're going to examine our own unconscious biases. So even if you perhaps don't feel as though uh, you're somebody for whom class has been a particular impact on your career, I would still encourage you to stick with this because um, we're going to talk, we're going to look at how it how it plays out for you in the ways that you might inadvertently uh, have have been complicit in classism. So it's going to be hopefully quite interesting. Um, I'll just start by reminding everybody what the broad uh, inclusion diversity mission is in Cantor. This won't be news, hopefully even, we feel this every day, I guess, but the word flourish pops out as one of our key pillars. But the whole point about our um, inclusion diversity mission, how much we're committed to it, is that we are really, you know, fully committed to giving everybody who's in our business already who wants to join it a platform to flourish, that they can bring their whole selves to work or as much as they'd like to, probably don't bring your whole self sometimes, but as much as you want to, you can feel open to bringing that, that into the workplace. Um, but also that when we notice, notice things that aren't right or we think could be better, that we are empowered to make change um, for ourselves and for our colleagues. So we've got Claire here from the HR side who's going to um, be kind of fielding some of this as we get to that a little bit later. But Adele and I are going to talk more generally about um, what we know about class at Kantar. Adele's going to share a little bit of her own experience as well, which will be really interesting. Um, and we're going to get you guys involved heavily as well. But the first thing to say is that, like I mentioned, I don't think we've really covered this um, as a business, um, possibly because class is arguably a bit more intangible and possibly a bit more nebulous um, than uh, some of the other DNI spaces. Um, you know, fairly obviously, people's ethnicity and their gender may be a more obvious, and and we've obviously spent a lot of time rightly covering those issues. But class is, particularly in the UK, potentially is, is sort of uh, weighted down by quite a lot of emotional baggage um, for years gone by. And so perhaps it's easy just not to cover it. But today we're going to try and do that. We're saying, though, that while I said in the preamble that went out in the invite, that is this a peculiarly British thing? I think I can demonstrate in a second that it, it actually isn't. Um, because we've borrowed some brilliant research from one of them, Thompson, that we can send around if anyone's interested, that looked at a whole raft of um, markets uh, and how much class has played a role. If you take a slightly broader definition of class, um, it's coming up as the most prevalent form of discrimination um, in, uh, of six that they put out there in all of their kind of key markets. Um, we know that there's a sort of background of this in England. Uh, you don't have to watch any drama to, for it to see it come to life, but it's, there's a real caste system in Southeast Asian company, countries. Um, and in the US, while I've done some work recently where we talked to them about class and they didn't really understand that as a concept, when you take a wider view of it as socio-economic differences, um, then suddenly this really comes to life. And if we look just actually at the UK and the US as a sort of starting point, you might think that class doesn't play a role in the US. It's all about the American dream and it's, it's basically about money in a kind of stricter sense. But if you take that, that, that view of it that you see here around how they stereotype the top three stereotypes in both these countries, actually low income um, people, in this case, it would be a lot of working class people in the UK, you think about some of our TV dramas and the same in the US are the most stereotyped people and therefore to some extent discriminated against institutionally by design. And classism comes up strong in both these in both these markets. So my supposition is that this is relevant across uh, the world, but we've also got a very international audience. and We'll find out in a second if that feels right for each of you. But for the person today, the way, way we're defining classism, well, this is the official definition at classism.org, which is basically differential treatment based on social class or perceived class. Ranking people according to their economic status, family lineage, job status, level of education and other divisions. That's obviously right, but I think also possibly I want us to explore this a little bit further today around how some of the ways that we may be complicit in classism aren't quite so overt as this. It may not be that we are, you know, malintent across a class is is very some maybe feels very deliberate. Actually, this can also be very subtle. It can be about 
the ways that we make our own assumptions around people and where their their background based on you know their, their accent their appearance their, their background the perceived life experience did they or did they not have a gap year some of these things all start feeding the same um uh classist um kind of back backdrop so we're gonna we're gonna cover this i think it's gonna be kind of interesting but like i said it's not gonna be me waffling on the whole time you're pleased to hear we're gonna get you guys involved at regular points throughout so grab your mobile device um it will be with you it's never not apart from possibly hopefully in the shower um, and go to slido uh, sli.do worth mentioning that anything you want to say there'll be opportunities to add your comments through slido so if possible try and avoid using the chat mainly because i can't see it I'm on my laptop not my second screen so go to slido sli.do or slido.com both take you to this page and i wasn't feeling terribly creative the code today is class i don't think it matters if you put a capital c or not but type in class and then you'll get into the um, inside of the system where if you go to the polls tab for now, right now you won't see anything, but I'm going to start populating it. So hopefully that's happening. So let's start with a slightly silly one just to kind of warm us up and get the hang of how to use Slido if anyone's uninitiated. Um, I mentioned the UK having quite a fairly obvious associations with class. Downton Abbey won't be news to anyone. I don't know if anyone's of a vintage they can remember 2004's Football Factory, the breakthrough of Danny Dyer on the left. My question to you, and doesn't matter if you get this wrong, is which of these has the higher IMDb rating? Football Factory or Downton Abbey? So you should click the one you want and hit send on the Slido. Thank God it's working. Oh, and it's, it's a relative even race for a while, but it looks as though Downton Abbey oh, is Football Factory making a comeback. That's my phone ringing. Um, but 60% uh, of you seem to think that Downton Abbey is uh, going to be the higher rated uh, of those two movies. Uh, I'm happy to tell you that you are right, although it's not an awful lot in it, uh, both worth a watch. OK, let's get into some more of the kind of personal stuff. And I'll, I'll reiterate that everything on Slido, one of the reasons we're using this is that it is uh, entirely anonymized. So everything you click, anything you vote for and everything you say in the open text ones later um, will be anonymized. No one will know uh, if you feel sensitive about this. So first thing is, yeah, do you feel, like I said before, I was making some assumptions, do you feel as though you associate with a particular class? And as I expected, most do, but actually quite interesting, quite a big, big number don't. And um, we'll probably understand a little bit more about that in a minute. But at the moment, 77% of our audience uh, identifies themselves with a particular class one way or the other. So the next question, perhaps obviously, is how you identify. Again, this is anonymous and I've given you, it's a bit probably a bit of a blunt instrument, but four options. Um, and I suspect the first three will be the, the principal ones, but someone's gone in upper class, good for you. Um, but the majority of our workforce, it seems, sits somewhere in the lower middle class and working class um, brackets. All the upper middle class is making a bit of a comeback here in this little horse race. Um, but middle class, lower middle class, but we do, according to this, we've got a pretty good, these numbers are, don't worry, we're not going to use this as robust data, but it's just useful as a guide to sort of take the temperature of this of this group. 29% of you at the moment identify as working class, which is which is really, really interesting. Up middle class is really refusing to, to die here. It's coming up. OK, let's um, let's continue. Um, I mentioned before about the various areas around IND where, um, we, you know, we rightly talk a lot about um, sexual orientation, ethnicity. Um, we have covered age a bit and disability a bit, probably not as much as we should. And there's a really good ERG on um, on age, um, but we haven't perhaps done enough on class. But the point is, the extent to which when we and, and, and a dash next month is going to do a piece, or actually in September, I think, on intersectionality. The extent to which maybe 76% of you identify as a particular class, but to what extent is this one of the defining features of you, I guess? Or do you feel as though this comes a sort of second or third behind your ethnicity, your sexual orientation, whatever? So I'm just curious to know, in the terms of intersectionality, um, how much do you feel your class is really being a driving feature of your life? Um, yes or no? Let me just make this smaller so we can see the answer. Uh, 
That's better. So the overwhelming majority here um, see class as a sort of secondary feature, should we say, behind other things that make them me more. Um, and yet for a pretty sizable number still, 20 odd percent, their class is perhaps their defining characteristic more than um, than others. So that's really kind of interesting. It shows again this intersectionality is really interesting. You're neither, you're not just one thing, you're many things, but class clearly has quite a significant role to play within that, which is um, which is why we're talking about it. Um, and the final thing before we go into some data, the final activity for you guys is a ranking exercise. So this one's going to take a couple of minutes because there's seven options, but I want you to think about this. What do you feel defines class and drives uh, the definition of self, how somebody perceives themselves or is perceived by others. So I've given you, as you'll see here, seven choices of what are the drivers of a person's social class. And I want you to rank them. So take a second to read them and then basically click them in order and click send. Um, not the easiest job to do, but um, click through the ones you like, hit send, and then um, we'll start to see an aggregation of uh, what you guys think. At the moment, uh, well, I'll give it a bit longer actually because only five of you have had a chance to do it. So take a second. So, in the first furlong here, we're looking at what parents, what your parents did or do for a living and your schooling. Um, but there is also a sense here about disposable wealth. Um, it's not something um, that's you know, like, in, like I mentioned, other, other, other markets, particularly where wealth is a key feature of your social status, like the US, for example. Um, but that's coming up pretty strongly here amongst this group as well. Less interested in where they grew up, if we're in the UK, geographic divides, your accent, uh, house you grew up in, etc. And, and even where you got to in the education stakes is there, but it's, it's, a little, it's lower down from actually the, that fundamental thing about where you went to school and what your parents yeah. did super interesting James because there was a bit of chatter in the chat about one of the very first question what class are you people were saying well how, you know someone said how do you define these classes and if we could solve that question today many many thousands of books have not managed to but it's a very healthy question what's very interesting about this is it's sort of locked in right <laughs> if your exactly. class is defined by the school you went to what your parents did for a living and less so things like your situation today, for want of a better phrase. Um, it, it's actually fascinating to see these results because it kind of blows out of the water the idea of social mobility. Um, it raises that whole question. So I'm fascinated by this data. It was a great question to ask. Yeah, absolutely. That's my, my first thought as well. But actually the level of education you attained, you might feel as being the powerful thing and driving you forward in your life. But actually it's sitting behind where you went to school 20 years earlier, whenever it was. So exactly the same. It's uh, almost the class you're born is that the class you are. Um, and, and we're not going to cover that exactly, but it's interesting. Um, some some quick data. So we actually had a whole load of there's quite a lot of material out there in the world on this, and I'm not going to um, go through all in detail, but there was a few things we dived into that were quite recent, that were quite timely. This one from last year that pulled out some really interesting kind of data points. I, I dropped into that last example about drivers of class your and this is very uk centric but your um location because it's quite obvious as well if we look at the creative industry which is what this um piece of work from the social mobility commission was about we look at the creative industry specifically which of which we fall into it um and how uh, diverse we are as a as a whole industry not just within market research but more broadly and what was coming out there was obviously that your geographical location can be a barrier if you're nowhere near the southeast you're going to find it a lot harder to find your way into this. So there's a reason that that was dropped in. Um, and even today, still 44% of newspaper editors, columnists, broadcasters, I mean, you, you probably know the kind of, kind of people I'm talking about, a huge percentage went to independent schools. If we look at our categories a bit more directly, so the let's start over here, top right. The, the total UK workforce has 39% working class. Um, and 
uh, professional background, arguably, I'm not going to go into that in detail because arguably we're skewed that way, perhaps by design and the way that we've recruited over time. Um, but it's interesting to see that when you look at the creative industri industries uh, against that benchmark of how many working class employees there are as a percentage, the creative industries fall down from 39 to 27 percent. And if you look at advertising and marketing, which we think is where um, we sit, it drops even further to 23 percent from a working class background. Um, in terms of the creative industries as a whole, 20 percent of the industry went to a fee paying school versus the general population average of I think it's about seven and a half percent, call it eight percent, um, which is kind of interesting. So then if we look more directly at Kantar, we can even see uh, how this plays out for us. So uh, I mentioned the general population having a, a kind of 39 percent of whom consider themselves working class. Within our insights division, we are actually uh, about half of that, 20 percent consider themselves working class, although interesting to see there's a high number on this call earlier that identified that way. The real, um, I suppose, eye-catching figure here is consulting, where we're sort of four times below the national average um, in terms of our representation of those from working class. It's only 10% uh, that self-identify that way. Um, looking at, I mean, it came out in the data just now that you guys were sharing, where you went to school seems to still be important. Um, in the UK, those that attended a fee paying school in the insights division, it's about 17% in consulting, it's 30%. So if I remind you again of that national average of sort of seven and a half, eight percent, um, we are uh, over indexing um, significantly and particularly in consulting. You put those bits of data side by side, you can see there's a pretty strong correlation uh, uh, fairly obviously. So this is when I'm going to spin the ball to Adele to um, talk us through this piece that we've pulled out and identified on, on the on the page here, on the slide here, but also um, give us a bit of your your own points of view and story, Adele. Yeah, thanks, James. Yeah, so the image on the page is uh, a link to a podcast that the Financial Times published called Why Do So Many Working Class People Feel Alienated at Work? And James sent this my way as part of prepping for this session. And it was really fascinating to listen to. And if you're interested in this topic, it could well be worth a listen. It's only about 20 minutes or so long. I'll touch on a couple of elements of it as I talk through the next few minutes of content here. Um, <laughs> why am I here? I suppose because, uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about my background in a minute, but I think there are probably two reasons. One is that if you look at those criteria that we just collectively agreed on, uh, for this group anyway, around what might define class. I'm very firmly in the working class bucket there. But also, um, I've worked here a long time. I worked at Cantor an awful long time. And it's played a big role, I would say, in my internal experience and some of my external experiences as well. So when I heard this topic had come up, I was quite keen to be part of the conversation and then chatting it through with uh, James and Helen and the rest of the guys on the team, they thought it might be a good idea for me to share some of those experiences. And to really get into the spirit of things, I considered doing this in my original regional accent, uh, but I thought better of it in the end. I won't do that. It's been a really interesting exercise though, preparing for this, and it's actually been quite emotional at times, as James knows, as I've been chatting to him this week on Teams. It's also been really useful and there's been some new insights for me as well, thinking over, you know, the last 20 years or so and this topic. Now, the first thing to say is that not everyone's experience is the same, of course, and I'm sure you'll find that wrapped up here in what I'm going to talk about with uh, social background or class or whatever we want to call it, I've no doubt are other hang ups that are part of my psyche that have created a bit of a multiplier effect. So I don't speak for all people of a similar background, but I've tried to pull out some themes from my experience. And one other thing I'd like to say is that we'll talk a bit later on about some of the things that we could do better at Kantar in light of the data James just been showing you. But I would say that in my reflections, Kantar actually comes out pretty well. Um, certainly from my experience and quite rightly so, they've done some things very well, I think, and uh, I was quite happy and proud to realise that as I was thinking about preparing for this. So a very bit of background first and then we'll go on to the five insights that I, I think I've pulled out from my experiences. So uh, don't worry, it's not the full life story, but for the purposes of just filling in some context, I was born in a town called Burnley, that is in Lancashire, it's in the northwest of England, and I grew up 
in the town next door. People have heard of Burnley because of football, uh, but they've never heard of the town next door, Nelson, which is where I actually uh, lived and grew up. I went to a state school and I went to a further education college because there was no sixth form available at my school. And I then did go on to university, but we'll talk a bit more about that in a second. Uh, talking of parents' jobs and that being quite a strong defining characteristic of how we might identify or define a class. When I was little, my mum was a cleaner in office buildings local to us. And then when I was a teenager, she got a job, in my eyes, the best job in the world, which is packing biscuits at the biscuit factory at the end of our street. Uh, so we got some really good freebie treats at the end of the week, which was great. One of the perks of the job. Um, and she worked there until she retired about 10 years ago. My dad joined the army at 16. When he left the army, when my two sisters were young, he had a series of different factory jobs. And when I was a teenager, he got the job he was born to do, the job he loved, which was as a caretaker in a local primary school. And he retired from that job about 15 years ago. I've got two older sisters. They're quite a lot older than me. They both left school at 16. One works in a factory now and the other one works in a petrol station at the local Morrisons. And by the time I left home or was even considering leaving home for university. The only people I'd met who'd been to university were basically the teachers who taught me at school and at college and probably people like, you know, the family GP. I didn't know anybody who'd done that before. Now, um, James, if you're considering playing the Hovis music, don't start it just yet. There's plenty of privilege in my background as well. I totally acknowledge that. I had a pretty stable, happy upbringing. Two parents who have been happily married for almost 60 years. You know, there were lots going for me as a child. By all accounts, we were actually a pretty ordinary family for a northern town at the time. But that's sort of the point, because one person's ordinary can be a world away from someone else's ordinary. And it's when those two things collide that it can be a little bit tricky. So there were five things, five different themes, I think, that I pulled out when I thought back over the last 20 years or so. I'm just going to talk through each one quite briefly. Two of them are sort of external, quite practical things, and three of them are maybe more what this experience can do to ourselves if we don't understand it and sort of front up to it and deal with it. So uh, we'll get more into the psychology later, but we'll start with the two external ones. So the first one, is recruiting to the why, not just the what. Now, visibility of jobs is incredibly important, and I know Claire will come on to talk about this. I mean, it turns out there's a whole, there's thousands of middle class professional jobs that are really interesting to do, that really tax your brain in a sort of intellectually challenging, and compared to other options that you might think are on the table, depending on the school you went to and what your parents did for a living, they pay quite a lot of money as well. Who knew? I had no idea about that when I was young. So visibility of jobs and options and potential is so important to the first step. I joined what was then Mill Brown on their grad trainee programme straight from university. But I only knew about that grad trainee programme because I was already working for Milwa Brown. So from my second term at university, I'd worked as a market research interviewer on telephones, ringing people in houses up and down the UK, asking them market research questionnaires at the Milwa Brown telephone unit in Hull because it was necessary for me to work while I was at university. I couldn't aff afford to do it otherwise. So I went to the grad recruitment day. And I did most of it pretty well, evidently, because I did get the job. But the bit I wanted to mention was the competency interview and why that leads me to this idea of recruiting to the why, not just the what. It was the worst bit of the day for me. So before I'd done that, I'd done um, a presentation to a pretend client with some real link data, which made me want to start the job there and then because I found it so interesting. And I'd had a lovely chat with Gordon Pincott, for people who remember him, about brands and advertising. But then here I was squirming in my seat. Tell us about a time when you were part of a team and you achieved something significant. Tell us about a position of responsibility you've held and what you achieved. I hadn't been a member of any societies. I wasn't treasurer of the rugby team or been secretary of the drama society, partly because I'd worked any of the time I wasn't at lectures or other stuff that was going on at university, but also because actually class does have a layer effect and it had affected already my university life, never mind before I entered the workforce. At that time, so we're talking about the kind of early to mid 90s, about 25% of people went on to university and to get a degree. Last year, the UK hit the target, there or thereabouts of 50% of young people going to university, the target Tony Blair set nearly 20 years earlier. 
Now, I didn't go anywhere that fancy. I went to the University of Hull, but I felt like a total fish out of water. Uh, everyone seemed more confident than me. Everyone seemed to know more than me. Everyone just seemed to know how to behave in that environment. And I withdrew into a bit of a shell and I really struggled to make friends. And before you know it, I was far too embarrassed to go to a society and say, can I join you, please? Can I be part of that? I just kind of missed that boat, even though in my heart, I really would have loved to have done that. I hadn't had any internships. I hadn't had a gap year. So I had very few answers for the competency questions. I had to pull on stuff I'd done before university. I had to try and make stuff that was quite inconsequential sound a bit more consequential. And I can remember Dave Chantry sort of thoughtfully frowning as I was grasping for these examples of things that I'd done. And I worried all the way back to Hull. But thankfully, the way Kantar did the recruitment process then was able to highlight my strengths, but really more importantly, my potential. They didn't sort of focus on the what of my experiences to date. And there are all sorts of reasons why people might have had to make some of the choices they've had to make. And they discuss this in the podcast. They talk about not all CVs being the same. And in the example they give, they talk about the one of the girls who's interviewed. And she says, you know, a girl on free school meals who gets three B's in her A-levels might just be more indicative of someone's potential than someone who gets three A's from a brilliant school. We need to be looking at the why, not just the what of potential recruits. We've got to try and see the whole self that somebody could be bringing to work. Second one is getting the job is just the start. Crikey, yeah, it doesn't end there. Um, the podcast talks about something called masking. And what they mean by that concept is, you know, you come from a particular background and you come out of uni and you know how to use your pork, your pork, your fork for peas. And you maybe can name a couple of different types of wine. Maybe I don't know. But you get thrust into a world where you feel a bit like an alien and you become afraid of becoming exposed when small talk, normal small talk is maybe about skiing holidays and second homes and, and stuff like that, which is great but can just feel really intimidating and you start to feel maybe not worthy and that if you give yourself away then everyone else will realize you're not worthy as well and all you want to be is accepted and to belong and to do the right thing you've got a lot on the line if this doesn't work out and I didn't have the word masking for that but I was definitely doing it and I would say not so much actually internally at Kantar, but with some of the people we work with outside of Kantar, with clients, particularly with people at ad agencies and media agencies. And it's so interesting seeing that creative industries data that James was just sharing. I realised this week, actually, partly why I've always had a mortal fear of networking. I do believe that's a new insight for me this week. I think it goes back to some of that stuff. But there are practicalities here as well. So um, quite early on, I was going to other countries on business trips. And one time I had to go to Paris to do a presentation and the person I was going with was French and they had family in Paris. So it was a Friday and she said, oh, I'm not flying back with you. I'm going to go and see my parents for the weekend and, and you'll fly back on your own. I was totally terrified. I'd probably left the country a handful of times before that point. I'd certainly never travelled anywhere alone. I would go in those days, you'd go to quite fancy restaurants and have lunch with clients. And it really wasn't an environment I felt very comfortable in. I still remember now a waiter putting some bread, right? I knew what that was on the table, but a bowl of oil and a little bottle of brown liquid. <laughs> it's like, what on earth is this? And sort of sitting around waiting to see what other people did with it. And of course, they did what everyone does these days. Uh, and I, you know, I sort of followed along and did it. And there's another new experience and you learn a bit more and you go on. Um, but it was pretty intimidating at the time. I once, someone once had a quiet word with me about maybe dressing a bit more smartly for client meetings. Um, but I didn't really have much money to be buying, you know, nice suits and, and fancy new clothes at that time. And on reflection, whilst that feedback is important and it's helpful, it maybe could have been a bit more sensitive or, or done in a, a slightly different way. The point is, we think a lot about the tasks and the responsibilities and the competencies and the training required for the job. But there's so much more to it when the world you're thrust into is so unfamiliar to you and you just want to fit in and do well. So they're the two sort of external things. The first more insidious potential consequence is giving people a metaphorical leg up. This is what we need to do. Um, if you feel unworthy and at risk of exposure, it might and it did in my case lead to a bit of a lack of confidence and that might mean that you're not the best person you're not the best advisor when it comes to what you're capable of and I've been really lucky at Kantar because I've worked with people and bosses 
who've proactively encouraged me. They've really believed in me and they've pushed me to do things that I wouldn't have done otherwise. And the lesson here, I think, is that we should all do this for each other, not just line managers and line reports, but peers and colleagues. You should suggest to someone something you think they could be brilliant for if you think they'd be brilliant at it. Take the time to encourage people. Give feedback that has evidence. This was good because you did this, which really helps battle some of those limiting self-beliefs that the rational evidence sometimes can start to counter. And if you're in a position of deciding what opportunities people get, remember that just because someone isn't vocal or they're not pushing for it, it doesn't mean they wouldn't be brilliant at it. They might just not think they're capable of it. They might not have any idea where to, where to start. They might be the thing that needs the push. The way I thought about this this morning was like, be like the Queer Eye Fab Five for each other because they lift you up and they encourage you and they make you see what you're capable of. Uh, the fourth one is the fear can be real. That is something it took me a lot of years to understand. Um, I wanted to work hard. I, it's very important to me to do the best job I can. That's a core value of mine. But I became trapped in a cycle of sometimes quite literally making myself ill through doing that. And I just didn't know why. I wasn't chasing status or job title or the next promotion. I didn't have a big career plan with 20 goals on it that I was trying to hit. And yet to everybody around me, I was behaving like a workaholic. But here's one of the reasons. I was afraid. If you don't feel worthy and you feel like your success is on the knife edge of someone saying one day, hmm, we've realised actually you're not quite cut out for this, which might sound crazy if you've never experienced that, but I promise is an experience for some people, you can feel like you're living on borrowed time. Like you're living in a massive game of snakes and ladders and at some point you'll slither back down a massive snake. And whatever you want to call this, whether it's opportunity, equality of opportunity, social mobility, it's life changing for the individual. And the prospect of losing it can haunt you on a daily basis. But it can also, in a really weird way, drive you. Now, managers can sometimes interpret that fear as something else, as ambition, as seeking perfectionism, as determination, as a drive for status or progression or success, but it's worth exploring why someone is committing themselves so much. Why are they getting themselves into such a muddle over their work boundaries? Because it could be for a different reason. And the final one is that psychological safety is key. The podcast talks about class being one of the more difficult areas of inclusion and diversity because it's less visible, like James was saying, but it also is something that people actively try to hide. So it's quite hard to spot. Now, a conclusion I have come to for definite is that it's not a good idea to say to someone, uh, you're from the north, you've probably never been to a nice restaurant, let me show you how it's done. That's not the message here. There's a much simpler option. Get to know people. Try to put yourself in their shoes and appreciate their experiences with an open mind. And like all of the IND topics that we talk about, really try not to make assumptions. When I look back, I wish I felt like I could have said, I've never done this before, I'm terrified, safe in the knowledge that I wouldn't be the first person to say it and that it wouldn't be a shocking thing to say. I wish somebody had said, you're going to be travelling back from Paris on your own because I'm not staying, um, I'm not coming with you. Have you got any concerns about that? Or, you know, is does that, you got any questions about that? Is that all OK? Just a cursory, you know, a check. And maybe then I could have said, actually, I've never done that before. I don't know really what I'm doing in an airport. Can you just, you know, help me just feel a bit more confident about it? And all of this can be quite isolating because you might end up withdrawing into yourself a bit when you feel out of place and like you don't belong. And it can create a bigger issue. Your core sense of belonging can be affected. You're different from where you came from, but you're not quite authentically where you've ended up. And the most important thing we can all be a part of is creating that psychological safety for each other, creating a space where it's OK to share vulnerable things or ask exposing questions and know that it will be received with an open mind. So that's my five reflections on my experience. And I know class isn't having an isolated effect here. It's definitely intermingling with all sorts of other stuff that's going on that I'm still working on in my psyche. And someone else with a similar background might have actually found that it supercharged their confidence instead. I don't know. What I wouldn't say, though, is that my background held me back because of Kantar. And actually, it didn't not affect me because of me. It was the people I've worked with, the managers I've had, the bosses I've had, the friends that I've made in this company who have really got to know me and encourage me. I would honestly think on reflection, I've been very lucky in that way. But maybe we don't need luck so much going forward. It's a more open topic. I'm so happy that we're talking about this today because 
I said to James earlier, I feel felt quite nervous coming into this because I haven't really, I've been quite ashamed of a lot of this stuff for a long time. I don't think I am anymore. I, I'm a bit more open about it because I realise it's it's fine. You know, you can't blame somebody for where they grew up or what their accent is or what school they went to. It doesn't matter. And Cantor actually is an incredibly welcoming place of all sorts of different types of people. So I don't feel embarrassed anymore. But it's still quite a big thing to talk about some of this stuff, because for a long time, it definitely made me feel like anyway, it was something that maybe I shouldn't tell people. But now it's a bit more out in the open. There's also stuff uh, that Cantor is planning to do to make it even better for future people who might join us. So I think, James, is Claire now going to tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, first of all, I will say thank you, Adele. That was amazing. Really like open. I think I can't see any. If there's any emotions on the on the chat, I'm sure people um, will have that. I thought that was really fantastically open. I think what comes across really strongly, and I think you're right, Cantor is a nice place. Most people that work here are really nice people. Um, but the point about all these things in the ID space is that very often it's the sort of microaggressions, things that are inadvertent perhaps. You make assumptions about people in, in ways that um, make them feel uncomfortable. And, you know, I've talked to you about a friend of mine who's still their agency in the creative space, this is the kind of world we live in, they still go on a ski trip every year, which sort of seems crazy, because what if you can't ski and it's just assumed that you can. And But there's millions of much smaller things that you talked about there that I think feel really, really interesting and relevant. I think in, would encourage everybody to examine uh, how they possibly have made assumptions about people and how, to your point, they just need to get to know each other and, and allow people to be open and, and bring their whole self to work, as, as we discussed before. So anyway, thank you, Adele, that was brilliant. Before we get to Claire, actually, I'm going to, on the back of what you've just just, just described, get the audience back involved with a quick uh, poll again. And I'm happy to see there's also been lots of Q&A, interestingly. Um, so we might come to that if there's a bit of time. Um, so the first question is, um, and again, I remind you all this is anonymous. Um, do you feel class has had a significant bearing on your own career to date? Um, and I just made that kind of point about um, whether it's been advertent or inadvertent, but it'd be interesting to see where this goes. So the early uh, front runner, very clear front runner, I don't see this being caught, is that yes, it has had a significant bearing on your career. This isn't just for those, this isn't in the context of Kanto, this is any point of your career um, before you worked here or, or whilst being here. We'll come to Kanto in a second. Um, but actually a relatively small um, percentage, 17% at the moment, have feel as though class has been irrelevant in terms of how their career has progressed. And I've left this also ambiguous because there's a chance that classes help people as well, that's fair to say. Um, and so we're interested to see uh, which way you're voting in with that in mind. OK, um, I'll keep moving. This is the uh, the loaded one. I don't know which senior people are on the call, but let's get to it. Has anyone felt classism at any stage of their time at Kantar? And again, uh, this is anonymous. Let me just find the right button. Here we go. And I've given you um, three choices here, further to what I was just saying now, which is that it may not be that um, you've been directly uh, kind of judged based on your background, or you may have been, it may be these slightly more subtle ways that some of the ways Adele talked about that perhaps weren't um, deliberate, but still made um, her feel uncomfortable. Um, and you'll start seeing in the office actually soon a whole load of posters about microaggressions across a whole load of IND spaces. Um, and for me, it's been an absolute eye opener, understanding microaggressions in the last couple of years, because you think you're a good person, um, and then when you properly examine your unconscious bias, you realise that, yeah, maybe you have said things that people could have um, could have upset people inadvertently. And it looks as though that's been the case here. 50 percent of you. Feel as though you have been judged or, or made comments about inadvertently, perhaps, but it's happened at Kantar where you have been assumptions have been made about you. Comments have been made microaggressions that have presumably made you feel uncomfortable. Um, or somehow other to other people, which is which is obviously what we're trying to tackle head on. Um, but equally, probably happy to see that there is quite a big number, 41% of you um, who haven't felt that at all. So um, interesting story and about about 10%, 11% who have felt it directly. And obviously that is not cool um, at all. Uh, is another question. Uh, no, this is when we're going to go to Claire. So um, 
this is a, another piece that's part of the research we were doing about ways you can encourage better accessibility. I'm not going to go through this and labour it, but there's some fairly obvious ways that you can think about making workplaces more accessible. I remember my first uh, series of interns I did when I left university were all unpaid in London. I didn't live in London um, and I was fortunate enough I had mates whose you know sofas I could stay on but that is not possible for a lot of people so there's some simple ways that we can potentially um, look to make uh, uh, Cantel more accessible um, but let me not talk to that let's go to Claire. Claire um, I'll let you pick this up and I'll, I'll click the builds uh, as we go. Thank you very much, James. So again, thank you to Adele as well. I know the comments are, are echoing our own thoughts around um, what a brilliant session that was. So some of the comments that Adele made about the things that you would want to ensure were in place are replicated here. So I'll try not to just talk about the same thing so we have some chance to get into Q&A. But um, when I was asked to join this session, I was asked, do we specifically have a policy about class? And the answer to that is actually, um, no, we don't have a specific policy on class, but what we do have is a general policy which addresses fair and inclusive treatment. So regardless of whether it's your race, your uh, gender or your class, then ideally we want people to be treated fairly. The challenge with the policy is that obviously that talks about when things go wrong which is fine to have. It's fine to ensure that we have a policy that um, makes people feel conscious and, and, and that we will do things right and we will put things right if things have gone wrong. But what's even better than the policy is things like James just described, a opportunity to talk about microaggressions, a campaign to explain to people where they might be going wrong, sessions like this which obviously get us to the point to understanding those microaggressions and the biases that we might be having so yes we do have a policy it's not specifically about class but it is about fair treatment and it's about fair treatment for all so that commitment whether it be a policy or things like this we're doing we have um recruitment was an interesting one as well because as Adele had mentioned you know a number of us have been here for a, a lengthy period of time and we've always had actually quite stringent recruitment policies but one of the things that we've been doing most recently is adapting a process and a, a system called Avature. So what we've been doing is ensuring that even if we believe that we're actually further among, uh, along than we should be as far as or further along than other organisations have been, that we're still doing more. So what Avature does is it essentially means that all CVs go into a pool and they are assessed in a non-biased way. It means that we get access to a broader range of people coming into our organisation. Um, one of the key things around that, and we talked about it and Adele made this point as well, is a CV can look very different. So we have CVs coming in where people have McDonald's as obviously the experience or possibly they would have a week in the UN. You know, that's the kind of examples we've had in particular when recruiting our graduates. The benefit of Avature is that we get a variety of CVs to sift through and it becomes easier for our talent acquisition team to recognise that one CV isn't always exactly the same as another. So we've done those pieces. The other thing we've done is the, and, I, and again, I'm talking from an insights point of view. Um, when we look at our graduate assessment, which is the bulk of our recruitment, believe it or not, we do a lot of internal promotions. So our bulk recruitment is at our graduate space. We have put in things like um, uh, app based assessments. So I, I, it go, you go onto an app, it's game based, and it's against a profile, it's against a risk profile. So there's removes again the idea of bias and one of the other things we've done which is to Adele's point again around um, the recruitment techniques is we've become really conscious that it's great that people have mentors and sponsors outside of work and often what you'll find within a the social diversity world and social mobility world is that if you have parents that come from a professional background they're able to coach you on um, competency based interviews because they would have done them themselves. So they understand that you're about to go through a recruitment process and they'll understand that says you're about to do a competency based interview. Here's some examples of things you might be asked. Here's some um, guidance and some coaching and support. What we've done with our graduate recruitment is ensure it's a video process and people get three tries. So what they'll do is they'll hear the question, they'll record their answer, and if they don't like it, the opportunity is there to do it again. Now that is different to what we had previously. So whilst it doesn't completely remove the fact that some people have this wonderful coach that possibly is in their home versus perhaps not, what it does do is it gives people a better opportunity to put their best face out there. So we're hoping that that also makes a difference. And then finally, apprenticeships. So 
We're a really clever organisation and one of the things you would have seen from some of the purpose and heart, purpose and uh, values and project heart work coming through is that people really appreciate that. And when they talk about cancer, they talk about it being clever and academic and smart. And that's brilliant. But what it means is that historically we've had a huge focus on graduate recruitment and that being the only route into our organisation. And by virtue of the fact that, and I talk about my own background, you know, it's really expensive to go to university and it's even more expensive now. So by virtue of that, you've got an automatic issue with who can and can't go, regard, even though we've met the 50% numbers from Tony Blair's numbers. And we partnered with, uh, partnered with Multiverse around three years ago now to talk about how we can encourage apprenticeships in Kantar. And we've started to see a much bigger population of people coming through rather than just our graduate route. It doesn't mean we don't want graduates. It doesn't mean that we don't appreciate acad academics. And it doesn't mean we don't appreciate people that are in that vein as well. But likewise, it gives another avenue, which previously we just didn't have. On to the next one. Gosh, reward process and performance rating and transparency. So um, we have lots of conversations, as I'm sure you do in your teams, about the idea about being internally focused versus being externally focused. Because, of course, we're a professional services organisation and we want people to be pointed at our clients for the bulk of their time. What we have to ensure as well, though, is some of these internal processes that sometimes can feel quite clunky and quite internal and quite... Um, lengthy are actually there to really support us as in particular around fair treatment so the fact that we have a performance review process that is heavily calibrated the fact that we do um comparisons on roles and it's done by pay ranges versus i like you i don't like you means that we again hope to remove bias from our processes so while some of those things can sometimes feel quite lengthy and clunky actually from my point of view they allow us a level of governance which means we're being fair so that's another thing that we're doing to ensure we remove bias not just for class of course learning platforms um we talked about this previously and adele mentioned this as well as far as things that are on offer up until recently our focus has absolutely been on female balance in the organisation as far as really pushing and most recently we've run courses for all of our Sky 90 um, females and also a very large population of our scale 80s around female leadership and talent um, and that's run this year. A lot of those modules around things like imposter syndrome, I saw somebody mention that in the comments, or how you position yourself or how you can think about being a, a professional in the workplace. Um, are really relevant to the social diversity and social mobility avenue as well. So we have learning prep platforms and modules that people can obviously put themselves forward for, but it's absolutely something that we're considering as far as learning tracks. So saying, yes, it's out there, but you'd have to find it yourself. So is that something that possibly people might find useful as a track like we do with our female leaders to ensure that people understand what's out there? But there's a number of modules that can help people in that space. And then finally, the Make Kentar Famous. So Adele mentioned this one. We are generally a B2B organisation. And one of the things that we're really, really keen to ensure is that we're famous out there because otherwise, how on earth will people know that we exist and that we're this great organisation to work for? What we end up having is almost a self-fulfilling prophecy that if you work in professional services or you happen to have heard of Kantar because you, you parents or people like that have, have worked with them previously or you've or you've seen our organisation that way um, and that's a challenge so we want to ensure that we have a diverse pool of talent like I said before Avature really helps us because again it's a it's a programme which means that we can go further and wider out but in addition to that we want to ensure that Kantar is famous so we have um, I, and you would have seen this we have got videos that we've put out this year with um, people like Shane who's on the call uh, in order just to try to put us out in a position which showcases what we're able to, to, to do. One of the things we also do is we go over to uh, graduate seminars and we obviously do other school talks and things like that as well to kind of encourage ourselves to understand what Kantar is. Always on the lookout for people that want to support in that space. So again, if this is something that is uh, piqued your interest, then please do let us know. But one of the key things, making us famous, uh, then it's not just a, um, a constant flurry of people that already know about us and therefore we don't get any better or any any more diverse and that's the end of that super thank you claire um i think you heard from adele that Cantal has actually been a really positive experience by and large and you can see here from what claire shared that there is stuff happening but um that's not to say we're going to be complacent uh, as a business and 
this is your chance to challenge the business a little bit about what you think we could do to go further, particularly in this context of class. So what I'm going to do is open up a um, an open text um, uh, question, which I will then hide and leave open in the background, um, which you guys can spend the next, I'll leave it open for sort of 30 minutes. You can spend anyone who's got anything they really want to put out there. Like I said, it, it'll be anonymous. Um, that way you can then pick up um, later as we go along. Um, in the final nine minutes, or maybe we should finish slightly earlier than that, but let's call it the final five minutes or so. Um, I can see some stuff in the Q&A on Slido, but I've been talking lots. I wonder, and it's, I can't see the chat, sorry, I've, my second screen is upstairs where my Wi-Fi has gone. So can somebody, um, I think either Michael or Helen would perhaps be able to help here. Let me know if there's anything in, in the chat in Teams that warrants us quickly discussing before I go to the Q&A on Slido. Uh, what, what we've got coming up in Teams is a lot of praise for Adele, quite rightly. Um, there's just a few things to mention, so nothing that's going to take too much time. But there's a, there was a lot of agreement that um, I doubt there's anyone here who doesn't suffer from imposter syndrome in some way or other. So that sort of creating that psychological safety is key, um, as Adele was talking about. Um, other things around being sort of open and interested in people um, and somebody mentioned actually, which is quite interesting, the idea of how do we deal with clients or there must be a big challenge when clients are actually reacting or, or, or appear to be classist. Um, and there's a couple of ideas that have been put in there around um, what we can do in Workday and also um, a tool that actually reveals bias in some of the ways that we might be phrasing our, our job offers or job descriptions. Um, but those are the main things. I think most people have been going straight into Slido. Cool. Um, well, I'm going to come to Slido then and see what's in the Q&A here. Um, I'm not going to I can also come in a second back to what's answering this specific question. One question that I don't know if you can answer this, Claire, that's been people can vote for their most the most popular questions and two are getting a, a, a lot of votes, um, which is how we score against other companies on executives who attended prestigious education establishments. I don't know if they're talking about school or maybe Oxbridge or something, but um, before what I shared was the, the way we sit against the general population. But I suppose the question is, how do we compare to other big orgs? Um, and I don't know if you have an answer to that, Claire, but it's probably fine if you don't. But Yeah, so I think, and actually Megan's pointed out this as far as like some of the things we could log in Workday. Um, we don't currently have all of that information to hand, which is a shame. What we have, obviously, is the data that you provided where people assess themselves. So that it was the self-assessment, the um, uh, previous survey that we did but no it's not something unfortunately we'd have details on um I can give you the background of our own UK LT and insights but that's possibly not as helpful as it was, as it should be but definitely something we could look at so probably one to put on there um what could we do more of or armed is forewarned and all that so let's jump into um some of these there's 19 so far which is pretty good um Wow, actually, there's so much here. I'm not sure I'm going to capture it, which is which is great. And I think we'll we'll, we'll probably owe it more response than the final four minutes of this call. Um, but it's great to see this engagement. And um, I will leave this open, like I said, a bit longer um, for anyone to put in their comments because um, I'll collate that and also what's in the Q and A on the Slido. Some of which I think we've covered actually because it probably came in early on before we got to some of the points about recruiting non grads, etc. So what I'll just finally do, um, because I need to make sure I do this, is thank a group that does have plenty of class, which is the people in the background who've helped Adele and I pulling this together, and Claire, um, which is Helen, Raf, Sarah, who's not actually on the call, because she's on annual leave, and Michael, who've done a hell of a lot of heavy lifting in terms of wading through some of the data that we shared and pulling out the relevant bits and pieces. So um, my thanks to them. Um, we're all a little bit, uh, I don't know, a little bit nervous about tackling this tissue because it is potentially divisive and, and and perhaps something hasn't been talked about for some other reason. But I, I felt like that's actually been a really kind of constructive conversation. And this is just the start. We weren't in any by any means going to solve the problem of classism in an hour. But I'd like to think we've um, 
potentially opened a few, we've shared a little bit of data, given you a bit of context. We've perhaps helped people understand where um, there may be ways that we've been complicit in classism without even perhaps meaning to be um, by making assumptions about others or about what, 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 what their lived experience might be and therefore the way we should treat them. Um, and what came across loud and clear from Adele's brilliant share was that get to know your colleagues, get to know as much of them as they're willing to tell you and um, ask questions in a, in a constructive way. That's the thing that comes across again and again in all the conversations around IND. Um, uh, get to know the, the authentic real person. Um, and so I'm just going to leave it there because there's so much in the chat, I can't even uh, begin to get my brain around it and just say a massive thank you to everybody who's joined. Uh, and yeah, the conversation continues. <laughs>